And here it is, my beloved city, with its eternal river Liffey that shrugs off time. Dublin, to say the least of it, is no spring chicken, though its Molly Malones are as pretty and vivid as ever. Now on our 1,000th birthday, she is best described as a fat old one with a quick wit, a derisive grin, and a tongue in her head that can strip the paint off a hall door when provoked. In her long life, she has known us all, war, pestilence, and famine, faced them, seen them through, and carried on. Yet despite the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, her heart has remained kindly and beats as strongly as ever. Here before you is the capital city of a small island whose influence is felt worldwide through its emigrants, artists, and above all, its writers. Our overseas empire, administered benevolently, nurtures younger cultures like the United States of America, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and lesser places too numerous to mention. Dublin is by world standards a small city, but it takes second place to none in its influence on the English language. Down the decades, Irish genius has flowered here. From Dean Swift to young Christy Nolan, our latest miracle, the roll call spans two centuries, ever since English replaced Gaelic as the spoken language. Great names like Goldsmith, Shaw, O'Casey, Yeats, Singh, Becker and Beam are common coinage here. With James Joyce, enigmatic as this city itself, towering over all. And now we come to the bridge at the bottom of Wine Tavern Street, where a thousand years ago, Dublin was founded by the Vikings. The river they ascended in 837 AD was a very different proposition from the one we have just seen. The Viking Armada of 65 ships had to navigate a sprawling marsh looking for a defensive position, and Christchurch Hill was the first on their journey. Thus was Dublin founded. From the fort they constructed on the hilltop, they had a commanding, unimpeded view. The Liffey teemed with fish, the marshes with wildfowl, the not distant forests with deer. Water and timber for building and fuel was all about them. Truly a land worth fighting for. They had come for gold, Monasteries held promise of that. They were not to be disappointed, these savage warriors from Scandinavia, but their rule lasted less than 200 years. 200 years. Turn where you will, in my city, you will be confronted by history and the arts. Here, in O'Connell Street, is the bullet-scarred General Post Office, scene of the 1916 Rising, where just over 300 dreamers confronted the world's largest empire in a last bid for Irish freedom. This building, more than any other, marks the birthplace of today's Irish Republic. Down came the Union Jack, up went the tricolour, and the one-sided fight was on. Dublin was a garrison town. Thousands had taken the King's shilling and were locked in combat with the Hun on the Western Front. Ireland had become England in all but name. The Celtic flame had all but died. And if England had given the insurgents a kick in the backside and applied the Probation Act, Ireland was theirs forever. As it was, the death of the leaders by hanging and firing squad led to a rekindling of Irish nationalism and a five-year struggle began. In the bitter civil war that followed the signing of the treaty with our larger neighbour, O'Connell Street was badly mauled, in parts reduced to rubble. British grandeur charts much of our history, and it is to be hoped that the one-eyed bigotry that demolished Nelson's fine column in O'Connell Street will never be repeated. To me, it appeared as an old friend. The street seems empty now without its familiar outline. Generations of Dubliners who went to wooing made their first date with the Mott at its base. Many marriages were sparked off by him, and he had the kindly habit of turning the blind eye on some of the carry-on. The only Dubliner I ever heard who wanted the pillar changed, not demolished, mind you, was a poor old devil called President Keeley, 
who was a halfpenny short of a shilling, and wanted Nelson reversed to face north. He would see to it when we elected him. The reason? That that womanizer up there had no right to be looking down on Daniel O'Connell, the leader of Catholic imagination. The Customs House is the masterpiece of James Gandon, the greatest architect in the history of Dublin, and it is recognised as one of the greatest buildings of its period, not only in Dublin, but in the world. Building commenced in 1781 and took 10 years to complete. Its chequered history makes sad reading. For instance, it went on fire even before it was completed in 1789. Again, in 1833, it was almost consumed by fire, but fortunately it was again rescued, though its interior largely altered. However, the most terrible event in its history happened in this century. During a confrontation between the Free State Army and the Irish Republican Army during the tragic Civil War, the building was set on fire, and one of my earliest childhood memories is the Holocaust that raged for days. At present, work is again on foot to save the Customs House. Whatever the cost, it will be worth it. Any city in the world would be enhanced by its presence. A Dublin without its Gandon's Customs House unthinkable. At 12.30 on Friday, the 30th of June, 1922, this magnificent building, Gandam's Forecourts, was ripped apart by an explosion that rocked Dublin. Since dawn on the 28th of June, the building had been under siege by the Provisional Irish Army. They were pitted against former comrades. They had fought shoulder to shoulder against the British and won 26 counties. Just across the Liffey, over open sites, at point-blank range, the shells began to rain down on this architectural masterpiece, which had graced Dublin since the 1780s. Living in the inner city, the mayhem was all around us, and on this fateful Friday morning, my mother's nerve broke, and she made a run for the comparative safety of our mother's house. As we came up the quays, the roar of warfare was all around us, and as we ran up Boyne Tavern Street, the great explosion came, followed in rapid succession by other lesser explosions. Suddenly, on top of Christchurch Hill, the air about us was filled with great white flakes like a snowstorm. But this was a paper storm, all that remained of the country's public records, dating back to 1174. The records office in the forecourts held priceless treasure, never, alas, to be replaced. This great loss has left us with a huge vacuum in our country's history. Now, as we rise high over Dublin, the huge Georgian squares stand out, north of the Liffey, Mount Joy and Parnell Square. But the real glory still to be seen, intact, belongs to the south of the city. As we descend into Merrion Square, Georgian Dublin is all about us. Fitzwilliam Square just above it, and the long magnificence of Fitzwilliam Street. On the corner of Merrion Square is the house where Oscar Wilde lived. Wilde by name and nature, arrogant with the arrogance that genius sometimes brings, he was brought to his knees by another Dubliner in a London courtroom, Edward Carson who stalked Oscar with the ferocity of a stoat. The shaking and ruined world was far removed from the man who told an American customs official that he had nothing to declare but his genius. No trace left of the Oscar who lampooned the English fox hunt by describing it as the unspeakable in pursuit of the uneatable. Or the one who had derided marriage by declaring that any man can be happily married as long as his wife does not love him. Turning our backs on Oscar, we can see Leffenew House, where a mad and dissolute genius squandered his fortune in riotous living. Turning to writing, he left a store of chilling ghost stories behind, so horrific that today, no anthology is complete without a Leffenew contribution. On the square is Linster House, the seat of an Irish government since freedom was born. 
Built for the Duke of Leinster, it was the largest private mansion in Dublin. Purchased by the Royal Dublin Society in 1815, they added other prestigious buildings, which have since become the National Gallery, Library and Museum. Queen Victoria's statue formerly stood on Dinster Lawn, and in the early years of the Irish government, several members took to leaving bouquets at her feet, such as flowers, cauliflowers. Students hung yo-yos from her finger, which pointed to a disappearing emperor, and finally, she was blown up. The statue was not damaged, but the pedestal was wrecked. In storage for many years, the Irish gave her to Australia, who wanted her for their bicentennial. I have a son out there. Who'll bet she doesn't get another cauliflower next year? And here is St. Stephen's Green with its Fusilier Arch, erected to commemorate the Dublin Fusiliers, who met the Boers on the 20th of October, 1899, and the Boer War had begun. The Green has changed little since the generosity of Arthur Guinness made it much as it is today, though it has to be said that gestures like this opened many doors formerly closed to those in trade. But if the green has not changed all that much, the area around it has. I was born just in time to see the last of a mighty emperor disappearing fast. This exclusive area had completely escaped the mayhem and destruction that blitzed the inner city and destroyed some of Dublin's noblest buildings. But here, all was as before, a last bastion of exclusive hotels and Anglo-Irish clubs. The Shelbourne Hotel then, as now, dominates us all, though except for the scullions, vassals and wenches, is employed, skivvies to dubs, a real Irish accent was rarely heard upstairs. Get the stench of petrol and the noise of present-day Dublin out of your nose and mind, and take a little walk with me down memory lane. On both sides of the Fusilier's arch, the handsome cabs and jaunting cars waited patiently for a fare. The curiously satisfying sound of horses, heads buried in nose bags, munching was the only sound, except for an occasional footstep to break the early morning Sunday silence. Just across the road, Grafton Street beckoned, a street unashamedly dedicated to the needs of the rich and privileged, with its conglomeration of exclusive shops furriers, ladies' outfitters, and tailoring establishments where gentlemen's gentlemen ran the tape over the fat slopes of a declining aristocracy, and at least three fittings deemed to be the minimum. Not alone was this a place of shops catering for blue bloods, but the street, to emphasize its class, had a parquet floor, pine blocks instead of stone sets. This was so as my lord and his lady would not be disturbed by undue noise while sampling the confectionery and sipping the excellent coffee. The cabs went sedately by, and a kind of soft, posh clip-clop came from the horses' hooves, unheard anywhere else in the city. And now we reach the end of Grafton Street, and before us is College Green, Trinity College, and the Bank of Ireland, the old Irish House of Parliament. Of all Dublin, this place has changed least in the last 200 years. Should the statues of Goldsmith and Burke on Trinity Lawn suddenly come to life, they would instantly know where they were. Trinity College has stood for just 400 years. It protects the Book of Kells, regarded as the world's most beautiful testimony to Christian faith. Thousands of people come here to see and marvel at this illuminated manuscript. This university has produced a long line of famous people, but its most beloved son left here in disgrace, Oliver Goldsmith, that gentle little genius with the pockmarked face, who went on to become, perhaps, the most beloved writer in the English language. Not just loved by those who read him, but loved in life by his friends and the poor he befriended. Goldsmith, like Oscar Wilde, 
another Trinity student died as he had lived beyond his means. Trinity is an enormous college, really a city within a city. It has come a long way since its Provost Mahaffey, 1914 to 1919, said, and I quote, the writings of James Joyce proved only one thing, that it was a mistake to establish a separate university for the Aborigines of this island, for the corner boys who spit in the Liffey. He referred to University College in Dublin, where Joyce attended. Fancy that now, and how is your father? Dublin, worldwide, is synonymous with the national beverage, Guinness, sold now in 140 countries, and no documentary of this city would be complete without mentioning the brewery. Arthur Guinness leased one acre at St. James's Gate in 1759 for 9,000 years. Young Arthur, it seems, intended to be around for a while. Incidentally, the brewery now covers 65 acres. The first export of Guinness to England in 1769 was a mere six and a half barrels. Now the brewery exports almost a million pints per day and produces over two million pints, 365 days a year. Arthur's big break came with the opening of the Grand Canal in 1798 and horse-drawn barges brought Guinness to rural Ireland. However, it was the coming of the railways in the 1840s that exposed the total population to Arthur's creamy-headed brew, and for Guinness, that was truly the gravy train. We could boast that St. James's Gate was the biggest brewery in the world. It is still the biggest in Europe, but it was more a part of Dublin then than now. Little Guinness boats, their funnels on hinges for lowering while passing under a bridge, fussed up and down the Liffey. The brewery employed thousands more than it does today. From the coopers who made the oak barrels to the dray drivers who sat proudly behind the big Clydesdales, dressed in their distinctive Guinness uniforms, Sherlock Holmes type hard helmet, corduroy trousers and moleskin jackets, they were a happy breed in the hungry 20s and 30s. For too long, Dublin was known as the city within the canals, the Royal Canal to the north and the Grand Canal in the south. The seething, overcrowded city, with its thousands of Georgian tenements and the tottering Huguenot Dutch billies of St. Patrick's Liberties were held in their silver embrace that only a native government could break. The great housing developments of the 20s, 30s and 50s jumped the canals. Their barges, too slow for the 20th century, came to a halt, and these lovely watery highways were left to silt up. Within the city itself, small stretches were preserved, a joy to oil is weary of brick and concrete. They are forever associated with two great writers. It was down the Royal Canal that Brendan Bean's old triangle went jingle jangle. And a seat beside Bagot Street Bridge commemorates the poet, Patrick Kavanagh, who often hungry and always broke, haunted this place, and perhaps still does. Kavanagh and Bean are dead, but the work they did lives on. And now here, on top of Christ Church Hill, we come to the cathedral that shelters old Strongbow, the Norman invader who conquered Ireland. He was aided and abetted by Raymond Le Gros, Redmond, the big fat one, his very able hitman, so that the first of this narrator's breed came here as plunderers, and plunder they did. This beautiful old cathedral is sited squarely on the site of the original Viking fort. Dublin's other cathedral spire is only a few hundred yards away. Both are Church of Ireland, and well loved by the Catholics of Dublin, who have no cathedral of their own. Just up the road, in Thomas Street, is this grim old building, St. Catherine's Church, where another patriotic dreamer, Robert Emmett, was publicly hanged, drawn and quartered. This ill-conceived revolt, little more than a large riot, nevertheless was the first uprising within Dublin itself and was the forerunner of the rebellion of 1916. 
And here is St. Patrick's Cathedral with its park and flower beds, founded in 1190. In the 17th century, the church fell into a ruinous condition until Sir Benjamin Guinness came to the rescue and restored it to its present grandeur. The festering slums around which had crowded upon the church were cleared and a small park established, an oasis amid a poverty-stricken jungle. This benevolent gesture gave added luster to the name Guinness and one upmanship being as prevalent then as now, the Roe family of whiskey distillers decided to restore Christ Church to its present form. So that the rise of Dublin says that St. Pat's was built on points and Christ Church on small ones, Dublin is for whiskey. It was here that Dean Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels, loved and lost his cousin Stella. The Dean was quite mad by the time he died, but in his way, he was the uncrowned king of this area, loved for his brilliant mind, his eccentricities, and his impulsive generosity. St. Pat seems to have attracted street characters like Jam Does Wasps, Johnny Forty Colts, Shell Shot Joe, Jam the Weller, and other harmless nutters were thick on the ground. But best loved of all was the Coombs only cowboy, Bang Bang, who cleaned up Dublin with the shining door key, used as a Colt 45. Ah. I can see him yet, charging across the lousy acre, Patrick's part to you, pursued by half a hundred Indian kids from Francis Street. Bang, bang, bang. His ferocious gun fire, making many an Indian bite the dust until he would disappear into the little known canyons off Golden Lane, where he would be dry gulched again to appear once more in Dame Street, where bowler hatted bankers and brokers took him on with rolled umbrella rifles, the dying littering the pavements of College Green. God rest him, we could do with him today, when whiz kids, armed with computers, predict our terrible future, though somehow they never get it right. Bang Bang had it right. Life is a game. Play it while you can. Beside St. Audience Church is the last remnant of the Norman walled city. St. Audience Gate was opened in 1275 and now restored it is possible to walk into the past. Along the rampart where many a Norman spent an anxious night awaiting yet another foray by the Wicklow clans. Hereabouts is Fishamble Street, where Handel's glorious Messiah was first heard, and is the birthplace of Molly Malone, the inspiration of Dublin's anthem. St. Michael's, founded in 1096, was the only church on the north bank of the Liffey for 600 years. This is a grim place, steeped in history. The remains of the Shears brothers are here, executed after the rebellion of 1798. This ancient crypt has the ability to preserve indefinitely some of the bodies within. There are four mummified corpses there for the past 300 years. One of the dead, called the Crusader, had his legs broken as he was too tall for the coffin. St. Michael's is a fair deposit on nightmares, and if you like them too, creep into the crypt like the celebrated cat. Below lies the vast expanse of the Phoenix Park, where generations of Dubliners have sported and courted. In the good old days, when things were never worse, it served Dublin as well. Ireland's president lives here. The Phoenix Park has everything. Football pitches, polo fields, a racetrack, even a herd of 300 wild deer, a world-famous zoo, and is the largest walled park in Europe. Recently, the park, with its beautiful Victorian gas lamps, was classified as a National Historic Park, safe now forever. Although very much in the present, the overall feel of the park is vintage Victorian, its heritage that of an empire on which the sun never set. The Dublin Zoo dates from 1881 and is the second oldest in the world and noted for its success in breeding animals in captivity. The lion that snarled off the screen from Metro Golden Mare was born in Dublin, never saw a jungle, and was a roaring jackie like myself, 
though I never made it to Hollywood. Another important difference, he was better fed and housed than most Dubliners of 50 years ago, with his own private den and recreation area and several valets or keepers. Most of the Governor Generals who represented the British Raj in this turbulent country had, at one time or another, good reason to wish that most of Ireland's citizens had a couple of keepers as well. Dominating all is the Wellington Memorial, erected to the Duke of that name, to celebrate his victory over Napoleon at Waterloo. Wellington was a Dubliner who altered the history of the world, though he always confessed it was a close one thing. This massive obelisk is 205 feet high. Alas, fame and history are fleeting things, and Wellington is best remembered today for the type of boot he wore, wellies. Here before us is undoubtedly the most important 17th century building in Ireland. Its carvings, the finest ever to decorate an Irish building. Its classical lines compelling the eye to acknowledge its austere beauty. The Royal Infirmary Hospital housed battered old veterans of Britain's many wars. The first batch entering it in 1684, the last leaving for its Chelsea rival in 1922. To appreciate the hospital, a visit is a must to what is one of the oldest and finest buildings in Europe. Like love, as the song has it, it is the oldest and the latest thing, taken out of mothballs just lately to join Dublin's crown of architectural gems. Kilmainham Jail, the very name made Ireland tremble, as it killed off the children of every revolution, though it failed to break the spirit of this country. This grim old fortress, almost 200 years old, was the symbol of tyranny and repression, comparable only to the Bastille, and hated every bit as much. If you have never known repression, take a walk through the jail's dark corridors. You are following in the footsteps of martyrdom. Here, the Irish were put to death in numbers. Over the centuries, this Irish Bastille remained a busy place. The men who signed the 1916 proclamation and most of the leaders of that last rebellion were shot in the stone-breaking yard. The war that followed kept Kilmainham busier than ever. Many of my father's personal friends, fighting alongside him, paid the final penalty here. Come here and look. Have a good look. Observe the thick iron doors. Smell the dank air. See the punishment cells. Stand in the hanging room and imagine the horrific procession of nightmare scenes it could relate if walls could talk. Go to the execution yard and then, by all means, go to the chapel and say a prayer where so many said their last. Facing Christ Church in Nicholas Street are the Ivy Flats another Guinness contribution to Dublin. They replaced a teeming warren of old Huguenot houses, fetid alleys and courtyards that had known the footsteps of Dean Swift. But even the Guinness fortune could not tackle the enormous cost of rehousing the people of the seething liberties. Ten families, large ones, were often housed in one falling down building, with one backyard toilet and water tap to serve them all. This was the appalling poverty of this area, where beshawled women, too broken for barrow work, could be seen any day in the chapel, rosary beads in hand, praying to St. Joseph or St. Francis, or if things were desperate bad, to the Blessed Virgin Mary herself, to intercede to her son for a little miracle, that it put a bit of pig's cheek into their mouths, or made frantic by the want of another, would boldly beseech the makings of a coddle for the daughter's sweet mother of Jesus, our fella is out of a job. And she has six children, and the eldest is making our first communion soon. And throwing discretion to the winds, 
We'll promise to do a special no playing you, dear mother of Jesus, and you'll get her a new communion frock, won't you? The crazy, heartwarming, drunken, poverty-stricken liberties of my boyhood. The thieving, generous, brutal, kind, suffering city of my youth. No wonder it was love-hate with me. No wonder I could never outlive it. So much viciousness, so much gentleness, so much Christianity that Jesus would have felt at home here. If fortitude and charity were the climate necessary to his love, surely then, on a second coming, he would be reborn again in the coom, a Jesus with a Dublin accent. Going away from St. Pat's can be seen the lovely housing that is replacing the smaller tenements of before. The liberties of Dublin will not die. The great clearances are over. People are once again moving back. The great churches, Protestant and Catholic alike, still dominate the scene. And the bells of the liberties, the eternal bells of my boyhood, will ring in the 21st century. And the pavement walk, Hip swinging, coaxing collins of the comb, cabra, cholester, and drum contra. The true bells will flash an eye at some fella of their fancy, and Dublin will go on. In my father's house there are many mansions, live and let live. There is room for us all in heaven, says Dublin, and so say I, her son. <laughs> 